So one of the benefits of having such a digital conference means we get to have speakers from all over the world. So this next panel, we have Yuri, who's joining us on the line from Boston, Yana from Hong Kong, and Peter from the Philippines. So everyone, I want to jump straight in because this is a topic which a lot of people have had a lot of anticipation for. And uh, Yuri, I want to start with you from the US perspective. 2020 has been such a challenging year, a year with a lot of pivots that have needed to be included for, for blockchain and emerging tech projects. How have you seen the technology sector really evolve in 2020? Sure. Um, so first off, Jessica, thank you so much for having me. This is fantastic. It's So it's hard to look at the, let's say, the entire tech scene holistically without having the big elf in the room, which is COVID-19, um, because COVID has changed everything, uh, especially when it started coming up in, in, especially in the US in late February, early March. So what, what I've, I've seen like pre-COVID and post-COVID have kind of changed a lot of things, but right now what's popping up is the importance of just digital readiness across everything. So from online shopping to robotic deliveries, digital contactless uh, payments, remote work, uh, supply chain management, telehealth, all of it is, being affected by what's happening with COVID. And that's a really interesting point because I think a lot of industries that maybe particularly didn't feel the need to adapt or evolve might have had to feel this extra push, push especially when it comes to removing the, the middleman or any additional third parties. Uh, Peter, I want to turn to you now in particular because you are based in the Philippines. How is the tech sector looking in the Philippines? What's your perspective on everything? Thanks, Jessica. And, um... Thank you for having me as well. Um, so yeah, um, just like for Yuri, um, you could imagine that COVID has really um, changed quite a lot on the ground here. Um, but actually, if anything in the tech sector that I work in, in, in financial technology itself, so in fintech, um, it's probably for the better. Um, so um, we've kind of been looking for that extra boost um, for adoption. And um, so, being here in the Philippines, you know, we're a very cash rich um, society where we have a lot of sentimental value towards cash. Um, so it's very hard to actually drive people to see um, kind of uh, value in actually adopting uh, digital cash uh, without actually adding uh, substantial added value to it. So just to back up what, what that actually means is, so the way that digital cash has actually been adopted up until now is really by adding um, services that are really add a lot of value in your everyday processes. So things like ride hailing, um, when Uber and Grab uh, came into the market, um, you know, they, people were very eager to get into um, uh, the, to, you know, use their services. And so one way to actually use their services is actually to um, use their, um, uh, payments platform. So you have to get you have to actually get into digital cash that way. Um, another way um, that we're seeing is obviously like e commerce is um, really taking off right now. And um, although I think it's probably had some hiccups in the first couple of months of COVID. So um, you what traditionally is quite a challenge here is actually um, logistics. And so having um, people actually, you know, uh, go out there, pick up packages and deliver them that's actually going to be a challenge. Um, uh, you know, people are actually kind of risking their lives out there right now. But yeah, we definitely, we definitely see um, a, an increase in e-commerce transactions um, coming up right now. Um, maybe just top it off. Um, so we, we've really been um, looking for drivers in terms of um, how to get the government in, um, on board and uh, to get kind of like local local um, support from you know, uh, regulators and so on. Um, and this has been a, a fantastic driver basically to get people to adopt a digital means of, for, let's say, um, there, there is an example in our city here in Makati where um, the student financial aid is actually being distributed to e-wallets right now. Um, because the students obviously can't go to school. Um, they can't actually go to physical outlets to be able to actually receive their payments. And um, luckily, the local city has actually got digital IDs 
of uh, their students. And so this is becoming like a great example of like how to um, you know, onboard uh, people into this new uh, digital system. And that's a really interesting use case as well because it is targeting a younger generation one which is probably more um, acknowledging of new technologies and maybe more eager to learn about something new especially when it comes to being cashless and looking at a more uh, fast way of, of a payment method. Yana, I want to turn to you now and ask if we look at the technology sector and some of the developments we have noticed, have you seen any particular sectors that maybe have outperformed others so far this year? From my perspective, at first, uh, at first, I would say thank you very much to joining here this conversation as well. I'm, uh, yeah, I have to say I'm more from a practice point of view. I'm coming really to connect the industries together. So it's, uh, I see here a lot of potential in the IoT sector, bringing together all the technologies. And I'm more really from an end-to-end -end, uh, process point of view perspective, not only based on blockchain technologies. But what I also see is an uh, uh, issue on, yeah, and trust uh, what is ongoing the next time what uh, what is the decision you have to take how to take the risk and so on and how to overcome the situation i'm absolutely with peter we need the government uh, which is supporting which give also some money give uh, people a chance also all the startups and so on that they can survive so this is uh, currently the issue what i see so how to create yeah a basis to survive yeah and uh, to create trust and uh, going forward so not uh, being now stuck with the situation with COVID and whatever, will, in my opinion, not the last crisis we will get. And what's been interesting speaking to all three of you now is some of the core fundamentals that you have mentioned are all very similar, but actually when it comes to maybe some examples, they've all been quite different. So I'm going to ask all three of you now, and we're going to go around separately, uh, any game changes that you're able to identify so far in the tech space so far, and maybe a challenge that has been put forward for that game changer that you've identified. Yuri, I'd love to start with you. Sure. So. Um... So at, at my work at Autodesk, we spend a lot of time looking at the manufacturing and construction industry. So uh, just speaking at both of those in general, there's there's a lot of startups that are coming up and the convergence of technologies is actually quite fascinating that have been sped up because of COVID. So, um, you know, Boston Dynamics is always top of mind just because Spot um, is popping up at a lot of places. So Spot has been in Singapore, helping people socially distance. Um, they've been implementing Spot on multiple construction sites that uh, allow them to site monitor, to do site scanning, to pull a lot of data from what's happening in that uh, on this construction site. And they're also able to help the construction workers stay safe, um, watch for potential collisions, not only between the equipment but also what's happening in the actual building itself and then transfer all of that data back to the original BIM design. And so there's a lot of, again, the con convergence and, and moving of different kind of technologies, which is absolutely fantastic and uh, exciting, particularly in those watching these older industries now suddenly um, adopt a lot of the stuff and, and move up. The, the challenges that are coming with, let's say, construction and manufacturing is, is just that there's a lot of uh, moving parts. There are a lot of, um, let's say, contingency workers and, and additional areas that have to plug in to make everybody talk to one another and work to one another. It's not a singular unit. There's a lot of, like putting together a building, there are hundreds of subcontractors, each, in, each having their own companies, their own ways of doing things, which is why traditionally construction has had a lot of delays. So how do you seamlessly integrate all of that data, all of that technology into one uh, stream that allows all of the subcontractors to talk and to get them involved? Uh, there's a lot of challenges in, in, involved in that, but it's uh, especially with COVID, things are moving up rapidly because digitization of everything is, uh, is taking place. And I imagine for subcontractors as well, if we look at kind of gig economies, having something which is automized on, on the blockchain or a process which is more um, on a ledger and recorded is actually more encouraging for these kind of these uh, zero hour contract workers as well. Yes, it's uh, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of use cases with smart contracts um, that are coming up right now that we're, that we're seeing. So, you know, right. So let's say spot is running around and 
taking in uh, snapshots of what's happening. They'll know exactly with the movement of machines and equipment, um, some of which are running autonomously, how how to uh, pay contractors at what time. And so, yeah, there's a lot of great use cases that we have seen pop up, which is fantastic. Fantastic. And, and Jana, I would love to turn to you now and ask you your perspective of a game changer that you're able to identify and maybe a challenge that that game changer might uh, encounter. Thank you. Uh, just uh, similar to that, what also Yuri is telling is about data. Everything is about data and to enable it enable data and also what I see with the blockchain in general is also to enable decentralized organization and uh, run around really to use the decentralized yeah, way of working together in a trustable way. So that means uh, not everybody uh, yeah, needs to know each other, more working really together uh, based on yeah, project-based level, which will be founded separately, step-by-step step on milestone approaches. So not a big amounts of money will be released. Uh, maybe step-by-step step, single releases, single packages of budget will be provided uh, to the teams. A challenge for everybody how to manage this and, and how to point to that and how to get the data and whatever and how to kind of contracts. Yeah, But uh, this is a lot of open question marks, how to go ahead and how to find the right way to get this budget also for his own organization. So it's a, uh, it is the government, I didn't think so. It is there somewhere a central organization where you can post just your project. I didn't think so, but anyhow, something in the middle. Yeah, it's a, uh, will be maybe right. So a, a lot of confusion, but also on the marketing point of view, a lot of people have to change. Yeah? It's a completely different way now how to attract people that you are and provide the right services, whatever. So this is also a change. You didn't meet the people anymore in person. You need a different way and you need to invest here. Marketing budget, I think not so much. People mainly on the technology sector, they are proud to develop technology, but not really marketing. So it's maybe something what needs also to be changed. This is the game changer for me with this COVID uh, to move in a completely digital world where you meet in the past people by songs and a cafe or whatever, a meet up, whatever, where you find ways to talk, not uh, making the cold acquisition uh, parade. So now you have to move to find a smarter way to, to get your, yeah, yeah, your project space up and running. So it's a, um, it's a, this is also a, yeah, a challenge, but yeah, I think. And it's a catalyst yeah. as well. It's somebody really, will like it. Yeah, speeding up the process completely. And now, Peter, I want to turn to you because yes. you are working uh, and running a blockchain and fintech uh, specifically co-working space out of the Philippines. So you must be inter interacting with some really fascinating projects. Are there any that you're able to identify that really are interesting and innovative this year? So, I Firstly, uh, I absolutely love Yuri and Yana's uh, responses, and um, uh, I, I love how blockchain has completely dominated um, everyone's solutions. Because um, <laughs> obviously, I work in this space, and uh, yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for it. Um, yeah, I, I think not not specifically for the Philip, uh, well, in the Philippines, but I think there there are a couple of projects um, that I. Well, uh, a couple of areas in blockchain that I'm specifically looking at um, with a very, very keen eye. And um, I'm, I'm, I myself, uh, as someone who works in the education space, I dabble kind of in and out of it um, just because of uh, my own interest. And so the, the two spaces that I look at are one, decentralized finance. Um, so de what we call DeFi in the, in the industry. So that's um, basically... Um, loans, savings, um, instruments, um, a, a exchange platforms that uh, you know, exchange different assets um, without basically the need of any kind of third party intermediaries. And so I think that space is really heating up right now. And um, it's kind of carving out its niche. It's still very much in its infancy, but you've seen a huge amount of adoption basically in the last couple of years. And it's got huge amounts of um capital backing um the space so there there are some really big companies um that will po possibly um come out of this space so D DeFi is 100 percent on the radar 
And then actually something that's not too far off this is actually I'm looking at the gaming space and you guys will know this very well at AIBC. Um, so I'm actually looking at blockchain-based um, kind of gaming uh, initiatives. And um, there are a couple of projects, actually one um, here called Battle Races, um, run by a friend of mine. Um, but basically the, the idea is that it, these are kind of like regular games uh, run on regular platforms, so let's say on PC. But now what you're doing is you're introducing in-game items that are actually tradable on blockchain. So, so you know these, which is something that we couldn't do in the past. And uh, these tradable items uh, can be things like land or collectibles or things like weapons in the game. And um, I personally have actually traded. I I, I made my first land. Um, trade uh yesterday actually so i've been holding it for about a year and what and what that means is actually you you need to firstly believe in the 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 game the team the you have to believe that this this community is really going to survive over the coming years and then um that you believe that someone will value your land um you know more in the future and uh, it's amazing so yesterday i actually flipped a piece of land uh for quite a profit uh, for about two, three times uh, what I originally spent on it um, last year. And uh, I think that's kind of like proof that this this um, this space is actually maturing and it, it actually has value. Now, um, if you couple the two, so if you put um, blockchain-based gaming um, together with DeFi, so with decentralized finance, now you have these um, exchanges which don't need to be kind of like uh, like monitored by any central party, but what what it means is that these assets that we're trading in these games can now be freely exchanged for other items um, in the whole world. You know, and it's um, if you can imagine what the potential of that will be is huge. So suddenly I'm you know uh, I'm trading I'm selling my land um, you know on an open marketplace uh, to someone across the other side of the world. And I'm exchanging that for, I don't know, like a, like a, a weapon in, in like the latest uh, first person shooter or something, you know. And that's, uh, I think, you know, when, once you, you open your mind to these kind of opportunities, you understand like, wait a minute, this could be huge. So I'm very excited about those two. Completely. And it opens a whole new conversation when it comes to um, tradable tokens, fungible assets, and then even tokenization of real world assets. It definitely the decentralized finance topic is something which it has huge focus so far this year. And I think continuing on, you're right, we are going to see this a lot more. Now, we do have to wrap up and I just want to direct one more question to Yuri before we have to close, because we discussed this uh, briefly off air when we compared uh, the markets maturing, as we've mentioned, and now we are in 2020 but even considering 2017 when a lot of people did enter the space it was known as the the ICO craze and we did see a lot of business investments come in but this was also where we saw potentially some bad actors come into the place a lot of projects that maybe didn't close off their their roundings or even complete the project project tasks that they were confirming they were going to do how has that changed the way that businesses invest or they look to uh, network with other companies how has that impacted the space <laughs> right um so yeah so i so one of the things i loved at least about 2017 is that this that the ico craze what it did was provide an alternative funding source for startups which was desperately needed but you're right unfortunately a lot of bad actors jumped in there there was a lot of scammers and um a lot of the projects that came from 2017 i i don't know very many that actually still have survived and, and produced um, an actual product, but it did create a lot of buzz, which then, you know, the ICOs led to STOs and IEOs and other kind of initials. Um, but what's been exciting about that is now we're watching a lot of large corporations, uh, very much like what Peter mentioned in the, in the DeFi space, uh, even to traditional banks looking for not just like, what is the technology, but how can this technology work for us? And I know you know, Bank of America, JP Morgan, a lot of the traditional banks have now put a lot of patents out there in the blockchain space because they want to be involved. They want to get along with the space, um, you know, for good or bad. But 
they recognize the use case of this. And we're watching a lot of that evolve now in 2020, where use cases are coming up and it's not just a flash in the pan, you know, uh, ICO type of environment. You're right, it's certainly interesting. And I think that the patent debate is a whole other aspect. I would love for this conversation to, to be longer that we could break down, but uh, thank you so much, Yuri, Yana, Peter. It was amazing to talk to you. That's, that's unfortunately all we have time for now, but really appreciate your insights today. We had a fantastic conversation and I'm sure our viewers learned a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.